be bowels, it could be bowelless. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it all. We've also talked about setting jokes. It's pretty, uh, <laughs> like, pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Right. A little. Um, don't. Uh, slightly throwing a bit of cold water on everything today. I apologize. Um, but not in a completely negative way, because I think it's important to kind of know the limitations of community archaeology before you can actually start working your way through them and create much better projects. Um, apologies also if some of this has been said before this morning. I just caught a horrendous traffic jam on the M74 getting here this morning, so I uh, missed, unfortunately, the first few papers. Um, so, into the Great Wide Open, if anybody's a Tom Petty fan, like I am. Doesn't actually have anything to do with the talk, I just thought it was <laughs> cool fun. Um, when I came to the Scottish Borders uh, five years ago to take up um, the archaeology officer job, the Borders was fairly poorly known. Very few people were coming in to look at it. Uh, archaeologists from universities. Um, the, the units weren't coming in very often because it turns out we weren't putting too many conditions on applications. Um, and the community groups, there was there was a certain degree of um, sort of a, a, a weakness in the community groups. They, they weren't engaging with archaeology. They were engaging with the history, but not the archaeology. Um, and there was also a large degree of poor relations between the community groups and the archaeologists, academics. And it turns out that a lot of this came from metal detectors kind of permeating through these societies and having really bad experiences with treasure trove in the 80s and 90s. And that sort of that sort of cast a pall over their desire to have anything to do with archaeologists. So it's sort of a cautionary tale. Um, so I'll just kind of run through these, these topics. Um, the benefits, the issues, uh, Strategies for sustainability, more like questions for sustainability than a few quick cases. Um, I think it's important to, 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 to bear in mind that community archaeology was just called archaeology in the past. Um, that, that we owe our entire discipline to community archaeology, um, to the antiquarians and the local interests, usually the guys with the cash, um, who went out and dug sites in the 18th and 19th century. Guys like Sir Walter Scott going around the, the landscape and picking up bits and bobs and putting them in his house <laughs> and on the mantelpiece, which you can still go see it at us. Um, and then, of course, guys like the Curl brothers um, from my neck of the woods, James Curl, um, a lawyer in Melrose, um, just decided one day I'm going to dig up a Roman fort, which is next door. And there you had. Uh, an excavation of Trimontium that lasted for 10 years. It was mostly local labor who were doing the work. Um, you, you've got his notes from the time, and, and he was doing a lot of basically trying to cajole people in Melrose to come in and work with him, um, trying to get cash off off, uh, off people in Melrose to, to, to keep, the, keep the dig going, at the same time as contacting people like Francis Haverfield and saying, oh, uh, I don't quite know what this bit of pottery is. What do you think it is? Um, all of that was community archaeology. <laughs> and through the process of that sort of antiquarian and early archaeology, you get this romanticizing of the heritage, which creates a tourism market, which creates its own self-generating community archaeology. Um, and so it lasted right away into the 1950s, 1960s. Here's a uh, lovely lady standing outside the door of Melrose Abbey. Um, but it also created the, the, the growth of the society movement. And of course, the oldest in Scotland is the Society of Antiquaries. Um, in my neck of the woods, we had the Barish of Naturalists, who were established in 1831. Um, I'll be talking about the Dumfrieshire and Galloway Natural History and Antiquarian Society a bit later, um, but they were established in the 1860s. And then we have the <laughs> The Hoyk Archaeological Society, which still exists but doesn't do archaeology, uh, and this is—I think this is a, a issue with some of these older societies. Groups like the Hoyk Archaeological Society were prolific right up through the 1950s. They were doing a lot of archaeology. They were walking around the landscape, collecting sites, um, you know, contacting the National Monuments Records and the Royal Commission, telling them about. 
of sites in the area. And we owe most of my historic environment record in and around Roxburghshire to the Hoyer Archaeological Society. But since the 1950s, they haven't, or 60s, they haven't done a lick of archaeology. They've become a history society, which is fine in its own right. Um, and they still go out on excursions to known archaeological sites, but they actually don't do any of their own survey and recording. And despite endless phone calls to them over the last five years, I still can't get them interested in doing archaeology anymore, um, which is a, a, a bit of a cautionary tale of the way to do it. Um, how to contaminate your carbon samples. <laughs> um, this, is, this was a, a dig in, in Coldingham in the 19... Late, well, late 1960s, early 1970s, um, which, which excavated Colding and Briar. Uh, and it was a community archaeology project. It was the Berkshire naturalists who sponsored this excavation, did the fundraising, and did all of the work. There were very few um, sort of academic archaeologists coming from the universities helping them out. And it's, it's a major site, it's a priory. Um, and they published all of all of their, um, their work in the proceedings of the Berkshire Nationalists, transactions of the Berkshire Nationalists. Um, not to a great standard, it has to be said. And of course, being a society, um, one of the dangers of them doing it themselves is all of their field notes are lost now. Um, most of their photographs are lost now. So all we have really is this, these kind of scrappy publications in the, in the Berkshire Nationalists. Um, but still, they're still doing it in the 60s and 70s. And one of, one of the, the, the big issues that came out of the 70s and 80s was the increasing professionalization of archaeology uh, and the move from academic archaeology to developer-led archaeology, um, which effectively transferred the sector uh, into a new realm, and it broke that link with the community. Um, though you know, some, some activity still took place, you just basically that was the sort of death of community archaeology there in the 80s and 90s. And so things like this didn't happen anymore. Archaeology just died. Um, we all know the methods of community archaeology. I'm sure it's been mentioned today. We've got uh, identity, knowledge, uh, being able to harness skills, stewardship, increasing stewardship is an important one, um, fitness, going out, doing things outdoors. Uh, community cohesion, um, being able to use education, economic development, turning a site into a, as Bruce was, was showing, it, into a, a new kind of tourism attraction, and, um, being able to generate uh, money off of it. Um, and for me, improving our HERs uh, and local decision making on planning applications. Um, but we also get our pet, pet projects done. We shouldn't be ashamed of saying that we get our pet projects done through communities. I mean, I, I think. We all know that that's the case. Um, but they also get their own things done. Um, so just, just to go through the issues as I see it, and this is just from experience. You know, I haven't really read widely on the subject, so you know, I, might, I might miss a few things out. Um, but age, I think, is, is probably the, the biggest issue with the societies in particular. And you know, Bruce was mentioning there might be some societies that look like they're not going to make it through the day. Um, there's some societies that might not be making it through the hour. Right? Been, I've been, you know, working with one guy, and I've just been kind of watching the, the clock a bit. But he's enthusiastic, and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to, you know, to, to, to step on his dreams at all. Um, but age is obviously a major issue, and it's not just the issue of are these people going to be around. It's also an issue of, especially if if, if you're working on a project from inception right the way through to say publication. It's, it's being able to keep them going over, over a long period of time, keep their energy levels up, keep them excited about the project right the way through. Um, on the flip side of that is young people, and uh, you know, to some extent with, with children, uh, you know, asking them to get dirty in, in a hole is, is about like asking them to eat pudding. Of course they're going to go and you know, do some archaeology, they love it, they absolutely love it. But, you know, with that age group, it's trying to keep their keep their attention on them, focused on the ground, focused on actually why you're digging and what you're getting out of the ground and what it means for them. Um, it's the teenagers that are the hard part, and it's it's trying to crack into secondary schools and um, and colleges as well. Colleges is even 
part of it because the curriculum in colleges isn't necessarily geared towards archaeology at, at present. Um, but you might be pushing on an open door in particular with rural colleges um, where they have land management courses. Um, although my own efforts to do this with Borders College hasn't really gone anywhere, but you know, still trying. Um, but it's, it's trying to get secondary kids involved, get them interested, to, to break the disinterest that they have towards just life in general, um, apart from their social media, and, and trying to, 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 to actually make archaeology meaningful for them. And I think for all age groups, that's the key to a sustainable community archaeology, making it meaningful for them. And then you've got demographic change, um, uh, uppers and downers, um, but also you know, diff changing ethnicities, um, and uh, you know, changing age profiles, all of these things um, within a community can either help your archaeology or kill your archaeology. Um, and and you know, it's, it's trying to harness the, the cross-sections of, of communities. It's trying to, to actually branch out into other different groups that you would normally not necessarily want to, or, or you can't get into them necessarily. It's, from the outset of planning a community archaeology project, you should be thinking about as wide a community as possible and not just focusing on the societies themselves, well, who are obviously important. But uh, the community drivers element, I've, been, I've encountered this a couple of times now, where, you know, great idea for a community archaeology project. Um, these are members of both the, the Melrose Historical an archaeological association and the Trimontian Trust standing across an earthwork or a series of earthworks um, at Old Melrose. And they've got great ideas for an archaeology project. The problem is the Melrose Historical and Archaeological Association is 20 people. Uh, and there's only two people who are actually interested in Old Melrose. In the Trimontian Trust, they've got hundreds of people, but there's really only one guy, or, well, two. Um, both in their 80s, well into their 80s, who are interested in old numbers. So it's actually, you know, we've got the right community drivers, we've got people who can actually crystallize the project. Uh, but if the rest of their societies aren't going along with them, then we might not have the project. So it's, it's trying to actually get them and harness their enthusiasm and get them to actually push through their idea to their membership. Uh, and that's actually kind of a difficult nut to crack in this case um, because they're very precious and uh, I think there's a lot of local politics in their societies as well. Local politics is obviously a, a big issue in a lot of communities. Melrose in particular, I think, um, they've been fighting each other so long. The borders in particular, they've been fighting themselves so long um, that, that these kind of local politics creep into every aspect of life. Um, and especially in small towns where everybody knows each other. Um, they might universally hate each other as well, and so you see, you know, it's it's kind of tricky to feed into those those communities sometimes and get them to to, to play. Um, whose community? Um, community archaeology is 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 a great great thing. It's a great buzzword. But whose community are we actually tapping into? Are we tapping just into the societies? I mentioned we should try to tap into a broad cross-section, um, but are we missing some elements of the community? Um, are some elements of the community actually disdainful of archaeology or not wanting to see the archaeology as beneficial for their community? And that can happen. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier in the question that we've got sort of political apathy in the borders towards heritage, um, which I think we can work around. Um, but there's, there's this sort of sense that um, anybody from the outside coming in, you know, trying to do anything, uh, is running counter to, to their own wishes and desires. Even if, even if they say, oh yeah, let's, let's do this archaeology, if they don't come to it themselves, they might not necessarily want to do it. So, um, so there's a local us versus them sort of um, community uh, um, aspect to it. So it's, 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 it's trying to, to kind of figure out which communities are actually out there within the broader community and how do you tap into those. Uh, resources and skills, 
this was a this was a, a fantastic uh, project that we had um, take place um, last year. Uh, AOC Archaeology uh, helped with the project in, uh, in Glen Rath, which is in the Manor Valley, um, where we where they excavated a, an Iron Age roundhouse that turned out to be a Bronze Age roundhouse, which is fantastic. Within what we think now is a Bronze Age ritual or a Bronze Age landscape. Mm -hmm. Forget I said that. Um, but the, there's an issue here with resources and skills in that most community archaeology projects have at their inception this element of training and we, you know, we feel that we need to train up the folks who are in the community, um, which is great. We should, we should do that. But after the community, or after the project moves on, what does the community do with those skills? Um, some, as in Bruce's case, they keep going uh, and they keep moving on to new projects and they keep their, their, um, uh, keep their skills active. But a lot of them just forget about it. A year after the project's gone, and then you have to retrain them. And there's sort of this kind of constant uh, emphasis on retraining in those cases uh, if, if you want archaeology projects to continue in that community. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of that, that we should we should be thinking about training not as a means to get the job done, but as a means to skilling people up for the long run. So emphasis on things like. Um, you know, plane table surveys and, and uh, uh, you know, just field walking more than putting a trowel in somebody's hand and telling them to, to clean off something. Uh, I think that's the more important element. These are the things that people will actually do after you leave. Uh, another issue for large uh, rural areas in particular is society coverage and, and community coverage. And in the borders, we have, we have some very good societies who are working in the borders. Um, so we have, for instance, the, the bigger museum's <coughs> trust, we have the Peoplesheye Archaeology Society, we have the Edinburgh Archaeology Field Society that occasionally comes into the borders, uh, we have the, the Till Valley Archaeology Society, out of Northumberland to occasionally come into the borders, and then we have the, uh, the border archaeology um, group, and then we have smaller ones like the Melrose and Tremonti Trust, and also the uh, Selkirkshire Antiquarians. In Hoyk, I mentioned the Hoyk Archaeological Society, they still don't do archaeology, so I can't really count them as being an archaeological society. Uh, but we have huge areas, say in Berwickshire, Lauderdale, uh, most of Roxburghshire, where we don't have any archaeology societies to work with. Uh, so if I wanted to do a community archaeology project in that area, it would be a case of me uh, either talking to community councils, getting something going, bringing one of these groups in from you know, well past their past that they're comfortable with, usually because of petrol, um, but or or creating an archaeological society out of thin air, which is how Tilfast started, uh, and that was that was to facilitate work at, at Flodden, uh, and they've become a great group, and they're doing all sorts of archaeology projects beyond Flodden now, uh, looking at mills and looking at the Millfield Basin, all sorts of things. And, but it's not universally the case that these groups will do that. There is this issue of professional versus amateur that we always have to be aware of. We can't just swan in uh, and say, I'm an archaeologist, would you help me with my project? Um, we, we always have to be aware that a lot of community, members of the community, are distrustful of us. And they don't necessarily like us because of past history um, or, or what have you. So it's, it's always important to bear that in mind. Um, post -ex is another, another issue. How do you get people interested in post -ex? Um Doing it on site is, is, I think, the key way to do it, and to have fine sorting on site, and to do your soil samples on site. Uh, primary versus secondary schools, I touched on that briefly with, with the age demographic. Um, I think this is a big one that Bruce um, mentioned before, the risk of oversaturating communities with archaeology projects. To some extent, you're pushing in an open door, but if you keep going back to them over and over and over again, they might be feeling like you're, you're using them. Um, so try to, try to spread it thinly, and actually, it would be better if you were able to create new archaeology societies, especially in areas where existing archaeology societies might, might cover some of that area. So you have a degree of overlap and you can kind of spread it around a bit if you're going to be creating a lot of these projects. 
Uh, just to very briefly touch on, on a couple of case studies. Uh, one which was planned and one which was kind of an organic community archaeology project. Uh, I was co-director of the uh, Galloway Picks project in Dumfrieshire, uh, where we, I should say Galloway, uh, where we looked at the site of Trustees Hill. Uh, and it's one of these projects which started in a pub, conversation between two archaeologists, uh, was able to get support from the look, from the Dumfrieshire Galloway Natural History and Antiquarian Society, and then moved very swiftly through an HLF application, garnering money. And before we would knew it, we were up on site, excavating the site, excavating old trenches from the 1960s that Charles Thomas excavated. Um, we had this laser scan done, this fantastic laser scan done that the Pictish carved stone there. Um, we had a, a website, blog up, reconstruction drawings following swiftly on. Um, and then and then there's been some community buy-in to it after we left. So it's been a fantastic project. Um, but I think the key to this one was it was almost done under um, under a commercial premise. That you go up, you dig it, and you get the DSR done and you publish it um, within a year. And you don't just keep going and going and going with the post sex and all of that, you just get it done. And that helped the community actually because they have now a story to tell and they're able to, to harness it. And, and this is uh, some panels that the children of the local primary and secondary schools are putting up in the in the hall of the village of Gatehouse of Fleet um, to, to, to connect the town with the site. And this organic project, and I call it organic because it basically took place because this guy who's in the in the hole there um, was finding nighthawks in this field, was concerned about it, contacted me. We knew nothing about this site um, other than it might be a tower, it might be something else. Um, went out within half an hour, I had about a dozen bits of medieval pottery in my hands. Um, so we very quickly were able to raise money with the help of Historic Scotland um, and then my own budget. We had a great geophysical survey done, revealing a huge structure, a bit more research, found out it's a bishop's palace for the bishops of Glasgow that we didn't really know existed before. And before we knew it, he was in the hole, he was the first one in and the last one out. This was literally 10 minutes after, um, there he is again, um, 10 minutes after clear up a loose on the last day. So <laughs> he, he just wouldn't leave, leave it alone. And now they're creating a new archaeological society out of thin air wanting to excavate this site more. Uh, so, just basically to, to, to wrap up, to discuss some of what I think is key to, to uh, building on sustainability and a legacy. Um, legacy, I think, should be at the heart uh, of every project. It's how the community feeds in, it's how they'll keep it going. So. To that extent, uh, the community should come first to developing an archaeology project, and the archaeology should come second. I think that's rather controversial, perhaps, um, but it's certainly my belief. You should go for a cross-section of the, of the community, and it's essential to do this across all ages and demographics. Um, I think social memory, and understanding how social memory works is good in, in terms of understanding archaeology um, in the community. <coughs> And then I think, um, finally, that you might be trying to push in an open door, or you might be thinking that there's an open door, but bearing in mind that there are segments of the community that don't necessarily want you coming in and telling them what is important and what they need to be doing. And so, so basically, you know, trying to keep conscious about that. <clears throat>